Wondery Plus subscribers can binge new seasons of American Scandal early and ad-free right now. Join Wondery Plus in the Wondery app or on Apple Podcasts. It's 11 a.m. on November 5th, 2008 in Chicago, Illinois. Illinois Governor Rod Blagojevich is sitting in his office staring out the window. He's lost in thought, thinking about the previous night when he witnessed one of Chicago's very own make history. Illinois Senator Barack Obama just defeated John McCain to become the first black president in U.S. history. It was a huge victory for the Democratic Party, celebrated by hundreds of thousands of people in Chicago's Grant Park. Obama's staff hadn't wanted Blagojevich to attend the rally in Grant Park, but Blagojevich hated the idea of being left out, so at the last minute, he decided to go anyway. But now, in the harsh light of day, Blagojevich wishes he hadn't gone at all. It had been painful for him to hear the announcements that Obama would be the next president of the United States, followed by the cheers of nearly a quarter of a million people, all applauding for someone else. Now, Blagojevich just swivels in his desk chair, overcome with jealousy for the president-elect. When the two first met more than a decade ago, they were both young men, two lawyers turned up-and-coming politicians in the Democratic Party both with bright futures ahead of them and both nurturing dreams of one day running for president. At the time, Blagojevich considered Obama a peer, his equal. But now Blagojevich has been left in the dust as his own career falters. His approval ratings are approaching single digits, and he can't seem to shake the cloud of controversy and scandal that hangs over his administration. The trouble started three and a half years ago in the summer of 2005, when Stuart Levine, a wealthy businessman, was indicted for running kickback schemes on several of the administration's state boards. After that, Blagojevich's close friend and fundraiser Tony Rezko was indicted for trading state business for campaign donations. Since then, Blagojevich has also lost his top fundraiser Chris Kelly to unrelated tax fraud charges and another insider, William Cellini, to allegations that he'd extorted donations for Blagojevich's campaign. With so many members of his inner circle facing charges, Blagojevich is feeling more isolated than ever. What he needs right now is some friendly reassurance from someone he can trust. So he picks up the phone and dials the number of one of his few remaining allies, an aide in his administration named Doug Schofield. Schofield has been part of Blagojevich's team ever since his first run for governor, and since then he's become one of Blagojevich's go-to aides, especially when he's looking for someone who won't argue with him. Hello. Hey, Doug, it's me. Oh, good morning, Governor. Listen, Obama's win, well, it's got me thinking about my own future. Obviously, I'm not going to be the next president of the United States, but I'd like to get something lined up. Like, maybe there's some place I can land in Obama's new administration. What do you think? I think that's a great idea. Yeah, but the question is where? Like, health and human services, I'd take that in a second. Sure. But that'll never happen. It's one of the top jobs in the country. What's, what's something more realistic? How about UN ambassador? I'd take that. Yeah? Can't you just see me? Taking on the Russians or something? Yeah. Lagoyevich pauses. Schofield's one-word responses are starting to unnerve him. So he decides to shift the conversation to the one thing he has going for him, Obama's now vacant Senate seat. As governor, Blagojevich gets to appoint someone to fill it. Hey, you know, I uh, want to hear something funny. My nephew, Alex... He just turned 26 today, so I call him for his birthday, and I say it's too bad you're not four years older because I could have given you a U.S. Senate seat for your birthday. You know what I mean? I, I can put in whoever I want in that seat. <laughs> yeah. I mean, I got this thing, and it's golden. Right. And I'm not just going to give it up for nothing. So what do we do with this now? How do we turn this into a... Look, I, I'm better off with this guy winning than McCain, but my, my upward mobility doesn't look so great right now. But how much more can you do than being governor, right? Yeah, there's nothing. I mean, there's one or two things, maybe. Blagojevich sighs. He'd hoped that talking to Schofield would lift his spirits, but instead he's feeling more pessimistic than ever. I mean, something's really messed up in my head, Doug. I, I mean, I could still end up delivering pizza somewhere, and maybe that's where my destiny is, right? I feel like, you know, I'm in a really bad place. Like, like I failed. Yeah, well, there is a bright side here to look at which is you've got something that's both important and valuable. And you know, lots of possibilities could grow from that. Blagojevich takes a deep breath and tries to take in what Schofield is saying. 
He wants more than anything to believe that his aide is right, that he's in a good place, not a bad one. So as he hangs up the phone, Blagojevich resolves not to accept his fate. He won't settle for a normal life. Instead, he'll do what he always does. He'll reach for the stars. But this time, it's going to be more complicated than just winning an election. To ensure his political future, Blagojevich has got to find the perfect way to play the one ace up his sleeve, an open seat in the United States Senate. American Scandal is sponsored by Audible. A room locked from the inside, a dead body but no signs of injury or struggle, the deceased a devoted family man, successful industrialist, and generous philanthropist, everyone around him seemingly innocent but hiding a secret past. In four sentences, I've grabbed your attention, and this is the power of classic mysteries and thrillers from Audible, like Esquire Magazine's number one best mystery novel of all time, Agatha Christie's Murder on the Orient Express. As an Audible member, you can choose one title every month to keep forever from the entire catalog of classics, bestsellers, new releases, and Audible originals, ready for listening whenever, wherever on the Audible app. New members can try Audible free for 30 days. Visit audible.com slash AS or text AS to 500-500. That's audible.com slash AS or text AS to 500-500. When you're an American Express Platinum Card member, don't be surprised if you say things like, Chef, what course are we on? I've, I've lost count. Or... Shoot that, shoot that! And even... Checkout's not until 4, so... Because the American Express Platinum Card offers access to exclusive reservations at renowned restaurants, elevated experiences at live events, and 4 p.m. late checkout at fine hotels and resorts booked through Amex Travel. That's the powerful backing of American Express. See how to elevate your experiences at americanexpress.com slash with Amex. Terms apply. From Wondery, I'm Lindsey Graham, and this is American Scandal. When Rod Blagojevich first got started in politics, it seemed like he couldn't lose. He won every election he entered, climbing from the state legislature to the U.S. Congress and then all the way to the Illinois governorship. Blagojevich was so good at campaigning and raising money that he started entertaining the idea that one day he might run for president. But in November 2008, his White House aspirations were hijacked by another political superstar from Illinois, Barack Obama. So Blagojevich changed course. With his administration mired in scandal, Blagojevich decided to press the only advantage he had left, his sole authority as governor to name the president-elect's successor in the United States Senate. Obama's vacant seat was, Blagojevich believed, golden. That's what he told his aide, Doug Schofield, the day after the presidential election. But what Blagojevich did not know was that someone else was listening in on his conversation with Schofield. In October 2008, the FBI planted its first bugs and wiretaps in Blagojevich's campaign headquarters. Later, they expanded their wiretaps until they were capturing virtually all of the governor's phone calls. And based on what they heard, Governor Rod Blagojevich would soon find himself in handcuffs. This is Episode 4, The Unraveling. In the days following Barack Obama's election, Illinois Governor Rod Blagojevich can't shake the unsettling feeling that his time in office is running short. His term will be over in two years, and with his low approval ratings and all the scandals surrounding his administration, it's becoming evident that he might not have a future in Illinois politics. Blagojevich can't bear the idea of just fading away into anonymity, but he also has an even more immediately pressing problem, money. Over the past few years, Blagojevich and his wife, Patty, have spent lavishly on clothes and other luxuries, and for a while they were able to afford it, thanks to Blagojevich's salary and Patty's real estate business. But that changed when Patty's income was essentially cut in half. In October 2008, a month before Obama's election, the Chicago Tribune published several stories alleging that more than three-quarters of Patty's real estate commissions came from deals she'd made with state contractors and others connected to her husband's administration. On top of all this, Blagojevich's campaign finances are also about to be at risk. 
In less than two months, an ethics bill will go into effect that will make it illegal for Blagojevich to receive donations from any companies that have state business. That means his immediate prospects for building up a political cash reserve are dwindling. So now, Blagojevich is getting desperate. With his personal and political coffers running low, he needs a new source of revenue to come through as soon as possible. So at 9 a.m. on November 10, 2008, Blagojevich decides to call his team of D.C.-based advisors from his home office to explain the urgency of his problem and solicit their help in coming up with a solution. Blagojevich dials into a conference call, and while he waits for his advisors to join, he pulls Patty into his office, hoping to reassure her that everything will be okay. Her face is pale, and he can tell she's more worried than she's willing to admit. Now that his presidential ambitions are faltering, Blagojevich worries that he's let Patty down. All right, everyone. Might as well get started. Patty's on the phone with me here. You're all on speakers. Everyone there? Yeah. Blagojevich takes a deep breath and starts his pitch. So, I think I've had pretty good success in politics. I don't care what the pundits say, but I believe I've been a great governor. And I'm not going to rule out three terms, but I I never saw myself as more than a two-term governor. With Obama and various other factors, there's a limitation to where I can go in politics, at, at least for now. And more than that, I'm at a point where Patty and I really need to start thinking about our future financially. So, in a perfect world, it would be nice to figure out a way where I can step out a little bit and make some money. Over the next several minutes, Blagojevich and his advisors toss around possible posts in Obama's administration that he could ask for in return for appointing Obama's preferred choice to the vacant Senate seat. But none of these options really seem realistic. Finally, Blagojevich's media strategist, Bill Knapp, cuts the conversation short. Well, you know, uh, the Resco thing, it, that, that's the cloud that's going to prevent this. Obama's not going to risk his reputation, not when he just got elected president. Blagojevich exchanges a pained look with his wife. It's infuriating how much Tony Rezko's indictment has damaged his administration, especially because Rezko was once a fundraiser for Obama, too. Uh, Well, okay. So what can I get from Obama for patting me? Nothing? Another advisor suggests that maybe Obama can offer Blagojevich or his wife something in the private sector, where it wouldn't be tied directly back. But Knapp shoots that scenario down, too. Well, no, no. Look, Ron... What if we approach this another way? What can Obama do at the end of two years, once your term is over? What can he do then that makes you better able to earn a living? Oh, we're not waiting two years, Bill. We're struggling now. But, Ron, I really think... Look, I don't want to be governor for the next two years, okay? I want to get going. Time is passing me by, and I think I'm stuck. It's no good. I gotta get moving. The whole world's passing me by, and I'm stuck in this damn job as governor now. Rod, who's passing you by? Everybody. I mean, we're struggling financially, okay? Patty's business dried up because the Tribune's been writing about every one of her real estate clients. It's getting bad. I mean, you guys are telling me that I've just got to suck it up for two years and do nothing. Just give Obama his senator for nothing. No way. No, 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 no. Hey, maybe I'll give the seat to Jesse Jackson Jr. (laughs) That would be revenge. Yeah, because Obama's people don't want him. But look, here's the immediate challenge. How do we take some of the financial pressure off of our family here? I feel like I'm screwing over my children. Gah! I mean, that's what I feel like. The whole world's passing me by and I'm stuck in this damn gridlock for two more years. Trying to do the right thing, getting my ass kicked, trying to get stuff done. Eight wasted years. And in the meantime, our daughter Amy is going to college in six years and we can't afford it. I can't afford college for my own daughter. Okay, Ron, I understand. Blagojevich locks eyes with Patty and gives her a small half-smile. He thinks he's finally gotten through to Knapp and his other advisors. Maybe now they'll get on the case and find him a lucrative source of income. But as Blagojevich hangs up the phone, he's reminded that he can't just live his life hoping someone is going to help him down the line. He needs results now. He needs money and career security now. Which means the race is on to figure out how he can capitalize on Obama's vacant Senate seat. As the end of 2008 draws closer, Rod Blagojevich is doing everything he can to secure his financial and political future. His goal is to solve both problems at once by landing a job that is both high-profile and high-paying. But how to go about finding such a job is far from clear. Some days, Blagojevich appears angry and frustrated with the process. But other days, he seems almost to relish the power the vacant Senate seat affords him. At one point, while listening in, 
The FBI hears Blagojevich comparing himself to a sports agent who is shopping a player around to different teams, looking for the biggest contract. But the analogy doesn't quite fit. For Blagojevich, there's really only one team, the Obama administration. And Obama still shows no signs of wanting to do any kind of deal with the governor. So as November wears on, Blagojevich finds himself making more and more wild proposals. At several points, he even suggests the idea of appointing himself to the Senate seat. Then he starts floating the names of different influential celebrities like Oprah Winfrey or Arnold Schwarzenegger. It's clear to everyone around Blagojevich that he's getting desperate, including the FBI. Ever since October, when the FBI planted its first bugs and wiretaps in Governor Rob Blagojevich's campaign headquarters, the agents have spent nearly every waking hour listening in on conversations and phone calls as the governor seems to consider using Obama's Senate seat for his own gain. But that's not all the feds have been picking up. They've also noticed that the Blagojevich administration is making a frantic push to grow its campaign fund, and the FBI is pretty sure they know why. At the start of the new year, a new ethics bill will go into effect, making it harder for companies with state business to make campaign contributions. And the feds believe that in response, Blagojevich is trying to raise as much money as he can before the bill takes effect, using any means necessary, even illegal ones. All of these calls are being added to the mountain of evidence they've collected against the governor. And on December 3rd, 2008, they pick up a call that gives them one of the most damning pieces of evidence yet. That day, at an FBI satellite office in a suburb of Chicago, several agents stand crowded around a computer in what's known as the wire room, listening in to the hidden microphones planted all over Blagojevich's campaign headquarters. It's only just after two in the afternoon, but already the agents look exhausted. They've been working in tedious, round-the-clock shifts for weeks, capturing dozens of conversations every day, most of which do nothing to help their investigation. Many of the agents have deep shadows under their eyes. Others have disheveled, unkempt hair. The office around them is in equal disarray. Empty coffee cups and takeout containers are strewn everywhere. But suddenly, the computer emits a loud beep and jolts the agents out of their stupor. One of their voice-activated microphones is picking up a new conversation, and this one is coming from Rod Blagojevich's office. Listening in, one of the voices is easily recognizable. It belongs to Blagojevich himself, And quickly they deduce that the other person in the room is his longtime friend and aide, Lon Monk. The agents know that Blagojevich and Monk were roommates back in law school, and Monk left a career as a sports agent to join Blagojevich's first campaign for governor. But for a moment, the agents aren't sure what Monk and Blagojevich are talking about today. Then slowly, they realize that the two men are discussing an illegal fundraising plot. The agents look at each other in stunned silence as Blagojevich appears to walk Monk through the best way to squeeze $100,000 out of the owner of several horse racing tracks. The plan seems to revolve around a bill that, when enacted, will benefit the track owner by saving about $9,000 a day. And from the way Blagojevich and Monk are talking, it sounds like the governor is going to delay signing the bill until the track owner agrees to donate to his campaign fund. At one point, Monk seems to acknowledge the shadiness of what they're planning, saying he wants to go to the track owner without crossing the line or making any sort of demand like, give us the money. He then assures the governor he'll tell the track owner it's not a quid pro quo scheme and that the timing of the bill signing is just coincidence. The agents look at each other, strongly suspecting there is no coincidence. And when the conversation ends, one agent leans forward to remove a disc from the computer. He stands up and gives his colleagues a significant look. This is what they've been chasing for three years, ever since political operative Joseph Carey accused Blagojevich of using the governor's office to trade political favors for campaign contributions. Now they have proof that Carey was right. Blagojevich and Monk seem to be running a shakedown scheme. So as the agent goes to deliver this evidence to his superiors, he hopes it might be the final piece they need to take down the governor of Illinois. Do you ever wonder where all your money went? Like every single time you look at your bank account? Honestly, it's probably all those subscriptions. I felt that way too, until I got Rocket Money. Rocket Money helped me see all the subscriptions I'm paying for, and it was eye-opening. Between streaming services, fitness apps, delivery services, it all adds up so quickly. Rocket Money is a personal finance app that finds and cancels your unwanted subscriptions, monitors your spending, and helps lower your bills. 
Rocket Money has over 5 million users and has helped save its members an average of $720 a year with over 500 million in canceled subscriptions. Stop wasting money on things you don't use. Cancel your unwanted subscriptions by going to rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. That's rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. rocketmoney.com slash Wondery. You can live out your MasterChef dreams. When you find a professional on Angie to tackle your dream kitchen remodel. Connect with skilled professionals to get all your home projects done well. Inside to outside. Repairs to renovations. Get started on the Angie app or visit Angie.com today. You can do this when you Angie that. At the end of 2008, after five long years of investigating, the FBI is ready to put Governor Rod Bogoyevich in handcuffs. But they will need to act quickly because the news of their investigation has leaked. The Chicago Tribune is preparing to publish a story reporting that the FBI has been recording the governor's phone calls. So the feds decide they cannot afford to wait any longer. And on December 9, 2008, they make their move. In the early hours of the morning, Rob Blagojevich is at his home in Chicago, sleeping next to his wife, Patty. Between them lies their younger daughter, Annie, who is just five years old and has climbed into their bed during the middle of the night. Across the hall, their older daughter, Amy, is asleep in her room. When the alarm clock on the nightstand starts to ring, Blagojevich turns over sleepily, but he doesn't get up. It's the day before his 52nd birthday, and he's hoping for five more minutes of untroubled rest. So he asks Patty to hit the snooze button, and he starts to drift off again. But just then, another sound jolts him wide awake. Lugoyevich groans as he hauls himself out of bed, careful not to wake his sleeping daughter. But as he reaches for the phone, he sees by a sudden thought, early morning phone calls are never a good sign. His heart rate quickens as he wonders what kind of news the call might bring. Has there been a death in the family? Maybe a tornado or flood has struck somewhere in the state. Nervously, he lifts the receiver and holds it to his ear. Hello? Good morning, Governor. This is Agent Rob Grant. I'm with the FBI. You're you're with what? The FBI, sir. I'm the head of the FBI Chicago office. I'm standing outside your house right now with two other agents, and we're here because we have a warrant for your arrest. My, My arrest? Are you serious? Is this a joke? No, sir. I assure you it is not a joke. Blagojevich rubs the sleep out of his eyes as he tries to place the voice on the line. Maybe this so-called Agent Grant is actually one of his friends or staff pranking him. But then the voice speaks again and Blagojevich's heart sinks as he realizes it's not a voice he recognizes. Governor, like I said, we're here because we have a warrant for your arrest and we need you to let us in immediately. Blagojevich's mind races. He needs to find some way to stall to get a better handle on the situation. All right, all right a- Agent Grant, right? I'll let you in in just a few minutes. I I need to make a few calls first. Sir, there isn't time for that. You have five minutes to open the front door or we'll force our way in. Force your way in? Seriously? Only as a last resort, sir. We don't want to make a scene or wake up your daughter, so please, Governor, come downstairs and let us in. At the mention of his children, Blagojevich's blood runs cold. He can't understand how it came to this. His five-year-old daughter Annie about to wake up to federal agents storming through her parents' bedroom. But it is no surprise to Blagojevich that the FBI has been investigating him. They hauled him in for an interview three years ago, and they've been slowly arresting members of his inner circle one by one. But he never imagined that they would actually come for him. He's always thought of himself as an innocent man with good intentions. But now the FBI is at his front door, and there isn't time to figure out where he went wrong. Lagojevich glances at Annie's peacefully sleeping face and realizes that he needs to act. Lagojevich hangs up on Agent Grant and jumps into action. He grabs the phone again and punches in the number for his assistant. And as he waits for an answer, Lagojevich resolves to fight whatever it is they're trying to charge him with, to fight for himself and for his family until the bitter end. On December 9, 2008, Governor Rod Blagojevich is handcuffed and taken to an FBI office to be booked. So, too, is his chief of staff, John Harris. 
Lagoyevich is then taken to court for an arraignment hearing, where he is charged with conspiracy to commit fraud and solicitation of bribery related to what federal prosecutors say was an attempt to sell Barack Obama's vacant Senate seat to the highest bidder. Lagoyevich pleads not guilty to all charges. The judge informs him that for the time being, he's free to go home. Blagojevich spends the next few weeks assembling his legal defense team and gearing up for a public relations tour where he hopes to profess his innocence on as many national television shows as possible. He also decides to ignore calls for his resignation and remain in office. And then, right before the new year, he makes a shocking and unexpected move. Despite facing criminal charges that he had been trying to sell Barack Obama's vacant Senate seat, Blagojevich decides to appoint someone to the seat anyway. His choice is a longtime Illinois politician named Roland Burris, who Blagojevich had defeated in the 2002 Democratic primary race for governor. Burris is a former state attorney with no record of wrongdoing, and under different circumstances, he'd be a safe pick. But in Washington, D.C., the backlash is swift and immediate. Democratic members of the Senate reject Burris's appointment. Blagojevich is disappointed. But for the moment, the fate of his Senate appointee is far from his biggest worry because for weeks the governor's former colleagues in the state capitol have been investigating his alleged wrongdoing. And on January 9, 2009, the Illinois House votes to impeach him. It's a major blow for Blagojevich, but he knows it's not the final one. Before he can be removed from office, the state senate will also need to vote. And on January 29, 2009, the final day of the impeachment proceedings, Blagojevich arrives at the state house in Springfield, Illinois. In the Senate hallway, he walks briskly past a crowd of noisy reporters, dressed in a dark suit and light blue tie with his thick hair carefully coiffed. In his hands are pages of notes he's prepared for his closing remarks to the Senate. As Blagojevich waits for the door to the Senate chambers to open, he bobs up and down anxiously, wondering for the hundredth time if he's making a mistake. His wife Patty has been urging him to resign from the governorship before the Senate has a chance to force him out and part of Blagojevich knows that she's right. He's likely to be forced from office, barred from ever holding a public position in Illinois again. And yet despite all of this, Blagojevich can't bring himself to give up. He's certain he hasn't done anything wrong, and it's not in his nature to stop fighting. So he's determined to make one final stand before the state senate. Eventually, the large wooden door to the chamber swings open, and Blagojevich knows it's time. Holding his head high, he follows the sergeant-at-arms into the room. Inside, it's completely silent. And as Blagojevich walks toward a podium near the Senate rostrum, the whole situation feels surreal. The faces looking down at him are familiar. Some of them belong to people who Blagojevich once considered friends. But their gaze is no longer friendly. Now, Blagojevich can feel animosity coming at him from every direction. And with each passing moment, it's becoming more and more clear to him that this might be one of his final acts as governor. Blagojevich nervously angles the podium mic toward him. But then, as he takes a deep breath and begins to address the senators, something wonderfully familiar happens. All of his worry and uncertainty seem to evaporate as Blagojevich realizes that this is second nature to him. He is a born performer, and he knows how to talk to a crowd. Years of political campaigning have prepared him for this moment, So for the next 47 minutes, Blagojevich does his best to dazzle the senators seated before him. He passionately insists that he is innocent and demands to call witnesses to his defense. He talks about his family, his father Rade and his mother Millie, who had instilled in him two things, a love for Serbia and a belief in the American dream. As he continues, Blagojevich is confident about his performance. But when he's wrapping up his closing remarks, he notices that many of the senators appear unmoved. The faces staring down at him look like they're made of stone. And that's when self-doubt begins to wash over Blagojevich. He wonders when he lost his audience. Maybe it was when he argued that what he'd done was no different than what all of them do to win elections. Maybe the senators didn't like being compared to him. Or perhaps he never had them at all. As Blagojevich ends his speech, an awkward silence descends over the proceedings. And he realizes that this time, his charisma has failed him. He could stay to listen to the Senate vote on his impeachment, but he doesn't think he can bear to watch what he is now certain will be a vote to throw him out of office. So with a heavy heart, Blagojevich walks to the Senate door and out into the corridor. Right now, he needs to be home with his family. He'll need all their love and support as the Illinois State Senate decides his fate.
Since 2013, Bombas has donated over 100 million socks, underwear, and T-shirts to those facing homelessness. If we counted those on air, this ad would last over 1,157 days. But if we counted the time it takes to make a donation possible, it would take just a few clicks. Because every time you make a purchase, Bombas donates an item to someone who needs it. Go to bombas.com slash Wondery and use code Wondery for 20% off your first purchase. That's bombas.com slash Wondery, code Wondery. Most weight loss plans are one size fits all. Not taking into account each person's individual needs. Noom takes into account dietary restrictions, medical issues, and other personal needs to build a plan that works for you. Everyone's journey is different, so your daily lessons are personalized to you and your goals. Stay focused on what's important to you with Noom's psychology and biology-based approach. Sign up for your free trial today at Noom.com. That's N-O-O-M.com. And check out Noom's first ever cookbook, The Noom Kitchen, for 100 healthy and delicious recipes to promote better living. Available to buy now wherever books are sold. On January 29, 2008, the Illinois State Senate votes unanimously to remove Rod Blagojevich from office. And in an instant, Blagojevich's reign as governor is over. So, too, is his endless back and forth over Barack Obama's vacant Senate seat. In Washington, D.C., Obama has been sworn in as the country's 44th president, and Roland Burris has finally been permitted to take his place in the U.S. Senate. But back in Chicago, Blagojevich's troubles are only beginning. On April 2, 2009, about a year after he was removed as governor, he's indicted by a federal grand jury along with several members of his inner circle. Among them are Blagojevich's chief of staff, John Harris, his longtime friend and law school roommate, Lon Monk, his top fundraiser, Chris Kelly, and Springfield power broker, William Cellini. Even Blagojevich's own brother, Robert, who has always outshone him when they were children, gets indicted. But despite the mountain of evidence collected by the FBI's wiretaps, Blagojevich pleads not guilty to the corruption charges against him, and soon his trial date is set for June 3, 2010. In the months leading up to the trial, some of Blagojevich's inner circle starts to turn against him. John Harris and Lon Monk both plead guilty and agree to cooperate with the government. Chris Kelly, on the other hand, refuses. Though he's already facing prison time for separate charges, he pleads not guilty to the charges in the indictment, seemingly unwilling to turn on his former friend Blagojevich. But then, on September 12, 2009, Kelly dies by suicide. Throughout all of this, Rod Blagojevich continues to tell anyone who will listen that he's innocent of all charges. He seeks out talk show hosts and opportunities to appear on reality television shows. His strategy, outlined by his legal team, is to become famous enough that he'll be hard to convict. So in April 2010, Blagojevich is delighted to appear on popular reality TV show The Celebrity Apprentice. <laughs> In the fourth episode of the competition, Blagojevich sits at the contestants' table, looking into the stern, squinting eyes of the show's host, Donald Trump. In spite of himself, Blagojevich is feeling a little nervous. Compared to his impending trial, this TV show should be a walk in the park. If he loses here, all he risks is a little public humiliation. If he loses a trial, he's facing prison time. And yet Blagojevich can't quite sit still in his seat. Somehow he feels like the two competitions, Celebrity Apprentice and his trial, have become linked, and if he can win the show, maybe it will save him in court. But so far, things have not been going well for Blagojevich. For the past several episodes, he's been overseeing the creation of an interactive, three-dimensional display to promote Florida's Wizarding World of Harry Potter theme park. And to his dismay, Blagojevich has struggled with even the most basic tasks, like using a computer or a cell phone. And now Donald Trump has summoned him to the boardroom to decide who has been the better team leader, Blagojevich or his celebrity rival. Blagojevich knows he hasn't performed well, but as always, he's counting on his ability to charm his way out of almost anything. So he summons his most innocent smile as Trump leans forward to ask his first question. So, Governor, did you win? Blagojevich is ready for this one and has already thought of a reply. He quips about never predicting elections and laughs agreeably when someone makes a cheeky reference to the FBI's recordings of his phone calls. For a moment, 
the charm seems to be working. But then, one by one, his teammates start to criticize his performance, saying he wasn't a good communicator, and that at one point, they even caught him napping on the job. So Blagojevich employs a different strategy, the same one he's been using ever since his arrest. Deny, deny, deny. I did have my sunglasses on, so maybe my eyes were open. This gets Blagojevich a few smiles, but it doesn't save him. In the end, Trump leans forward and delivers his signature line. I have great respect for you. I have great respect for your tenacity, for the fact that you just don't give up. But Rod, you're fired. Blagojevich's heart sinks as an all-too-familiar feeling of shame and embarrassment washes over him. It's like he's a child again, being scolded for not doing his homework. In a sort of stupor, Blagojevich stands up and slowly unclips the microphone from his suit jacket. And as he turns and walks off set, he's hit by a final, chilling thought. If he can't win over a reality TV jury, he might not be able to convince a real one either. Rod Blagojevich's case went to trial in June 2010. Prosecutors presented a scathing picture of the ex-governor, aided by testimony from his former friends and aides, as well as the FBI's covert recordings. In response, Blagojevich neither testified nor presented any witnesses. And yet, against the odds, and thanks to a single holdout juror, Blagojevich was convicted of only one of 24 counts lying to the FBI. This charge stemmed from an incident in 2005, when Blagojevich met with agents Daniel Kane and Patrick Murphy, telling them falsely that he was not involved in handing out state contracts and did not track who donated to his campaign. So the verdict was a triumphant moment for Blagojevich, but it didn't last. In early May 2011, Blagojevich was retried, and this time he decided to testify, but it was too little too late. Two months after the trial began, the jury convicted him on 17 of the 20 counts against him. And on March 15, 2012, Blagojevich reported to federal prison to begin serving a 14-year sentence. Other members of Blagojevich's inner circle also received prison time. His friend and top fundraiser Tony Rezko was sentenced to 10 and a half years in prison. Stuart Levine, who had turned witness for the government, was sentenced to five and a half. Blagojevich's longtime friend Lon Monk made a deal with the government that secured him just a two-year sentence. And Blagojevich's former chief of staff, John Harris, who also cooperated, was sentenced to only 10 days. But Blagojevich's older brother, Robert, avoided prison time. After Blagojevich's first trial, the charges against him were dropped. Then, in 2015, Blagojevich scored a small victory when he was able to get five of his convictions overturned, appealing his case from his prison cell. The dismissed convictions all pertain to Blagojevich's attempts to trade Obama's vacant Senate seat. An appeals court determined that the judge in Blagojevich's second trial had given faulty jury instructions. Had the instructions been clearer, the jury likely would have found that Blagojevich's attempt to leverage the open Senate seat for a job in the Obama administration were not illegal. But the other 13 convictions remain unchanged. And in 2016, a federal court denied Blagojevich's request for a reduced sentence. It appeared that the full term would be served. But then, in 2020, Blagojevich's prison term was cut short by the man who had once fired him from The Celebrity Apprentice. Now, as President of the United States, Donald Trump commuted the ex-governor's sentence. And after serving just over half of his 14 years, Blagojevich was free. In 2021, he sued the state of Illinois, demanding that they restore his right to run for elected office. But as of now, the case is still pending. Meanwhile, to this day, Rod Blagojevich maintains that he is innocent of all charges against him. From Wondery, this is Episode 4 of Rod Blagojevich from American Scandal. On our next episode, I talk with whistleblowers Pamela Davis and Bill Cotman. In 2003, they agreed to wear a wire for eight months to expose an extortion scheme that eventually led the FBI to arrest Governor Rod Blagojevich. Hey, Prime members, you can listen to American Scandal ad-free on Amazon Music. Download the Amazon Music app today. Or you can listen ad-free with Wondery Plus and Apple Podcasts. Before you go, tell us about yourself by completing a short survey at wondery.com slash survey.
If you'd like to learn more about Rod Blagojevich, we recommend the books Golden, How Rod Blagojevich Talked Himself Out of the Governor's Office and Into Prison by Jeff Cohen and John Chase, and A Just Cause by Bernard Seracki, as well as the archive for the Chicago Tribune. This episode contains reenactments and dramatized details. And while in most cases we can't know exactly what was said, all our dramatizations are based on historical research. American Scandal is hosted, edited, and executive produced by me, Lindsey Graham, for Airship. Audio editing by Christian Paraga. Sound design by Molly Bach. Music by Lindsey Graham. This episode is written by Kat Shooknecht, edited by Emma Cortland. Our senior producers are Gabe Riven and Andy Herman. Executive producers are Stephanie Jens, Jenny Lauer-Beckman, and Marshall Louie for Wondering. Alex Ryder is back. Hello, Alex. You have a lot of work to do. To face his greatest challenge yet. We have an active threat. They can wipe out an entire city. People are going to die. Now he's running out of time. We have three days to find and destroy. He doesn't know who he can trust. You're not your enemies. You never have been. Everything I've been told has been lies. And our future is in his hands. The truth can be complicated. On April 5th. This weapon is capable of inflicting 100,000 deaths. The danger is everywhere. Scorpio are no longer hiding in the shadows. The battle threatens everyone. It's personal. It's revenge. It's kill or be killed. That's when you find out what you're really capable of. And his choice could change everything. I'm sick of being manipulated to do what everyone else wants. Tell him the truth. All of it. The world is not black and white. All we really have are the people we trust. Alex Ryder. Season 3. Streaming free April 5th. Stream seasons 1 and 2 free now.